Good morning to all, and thank you so much for being here. Um, I am so excited because we have an incredible panel to talk about this very important um, issue. But I want to start by introducing myself and um, share a personal moment. I woke up this morning and realized the panel that um, I'd be moderating. What dawned on me was that in um, 1981, here in Washington, right around the corner, I switched from my pediatric residency training program into psychiatry. I did it because I felt forced into a gap. It was incredible at that time with all of the progress in medicine that in mental health, there remained these yawning gaps. That the rate of diagnosis, undiagnosis, misdiagnosis, underdiagnosis was high that the lack of awareness was staggering, that the opportunity to have tools for treatment for patients was slow against the backdrop of what was happening elsewhere in medicine. And our systems were far less capable than one might hope or ex expect. I had a friend at that time when I kept saying that the healthcare system, she would say, why do you keep saying that? And I would say, why shouldn't I? And she said, because we ain't healthy, nobody cares, and it sure ain't no system. <laughs> and if that is true of the healthcare system, then the mental health care system is just a shadow of what it needs to be to provide the care. So I got up this morning and I opened my eyes and looked around and said, wow, it's still the case that there is staggering need in mental health care this 40 years later that we continue to lose pace against the backdrop of technology that's moving at lightning speed, and we need to do something about it, and we need to do it now. And my hope and expectation is that this panel and you as an audience are gonna help think about some of the ways in which we can more crisply and clearly define the issues, the barriers, and the problems, and to begin to pull solutions at what I think is an amazing time of high unmet need and incredible technology and science um, to solve the issue. So, thank you again for being here. And um, what I'm gonna ask the panel to do is the lightning exercise of introducing themselves, name, rank, and serial number. And then we're gonna go back and, <coughs> excuse me, start to pose some very difficult questions which they are very capable of answering. So we'll get started with you. Sure, I'm Ron Kessler. I'm a professor of healthcare policy at Harvard Medical School. Bob, I'm Bob Nelson. I uh, am managing director of uh, Arch Venture Partners. We start biotech companies. Uh, Kay Jamison, professor of psychiatry at Johns Hopkins Medical School and co-director of the Mood Disorder Center. I'm Richard Pops. I work at a biotechnology company that makes medicines for serious mental illness and addiction. I'm Brandon Staglin, a schizophrenia survivor and president of One Mind, a nonprofit that heals lives by accelerating brain health discoveries from the lab to patients to communities. And Ron, I'm, I'm going to start with you posing the problem. So the mental health care system continues to struggle. And if you had to pick a single barrier that you think um, represents what holds us back in this, um, what would that be? And then also, is there something that we're not talking about that we really need out on the table? Mm -hmm. Well, it's very difficult to figure out one barrier, as you said. There, uh, you, uh, you have a lot to pick from. But the, uh, the one that I find myself concentrating on most is the following, that uh, there are an enormous number of treatments already in existence that are effective for treating mental disorders. Uh, the variety is much greater than for most physical health problems. But the issue is there's no one treatment that works best for all people. In the case of schizophrenia, there are 15 different medications um, for first line treatment, and we don't know which one's the right one. Uh, the VA that you just heard about uh, for PTSD, if you go to their website, they have seven different kinds of psychotherapy for PTSD. And they're all effective for 30% of people or so. If a patient sticks with every one of them, probably 75% of the time they could get well, but because people have emotional problems, they don't stick with things. The suicide problem 
in the VA and in the country as a whole, uh, people try one thing and it doesn't work and they try a second and it doesn't work and they say the heck and, the, and they're dead. So the real trick is how do we get the right treatments to the right people right away? Um, while we're waiting around for people like Bob to make breakthroughs for next generation treatments, it's important to realize lots of things work, but we're not getting the right things to the right people. And uh, much of the work I do is trying to develop precision medicine uh, solutions for things right now that can try to fill that gap. Thank you. So Bob, you want to talk to us about what you think that single barrier is? Um, I think the single barrier is, is data. I mean, we just live in, uh, in, in mental health in a really data-less world. Um, it's, you know, experimentation on the therapeutic side. You know, I can do it as, as well as my doc after reading for an hour. Um, and there is literally no quantitation about what mental illness is. So depression is this big word. It's defined by a 50-year-old questionnaire. And, um, and we all know that it's, it's genetically diverse. It's phenotypically diverse. And so I think we're the big revolution to, and the solution to that barrier is actually longitudinal quantitative phenotyping of, 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 and, and genotyping of, of mental conditions, um, which will allow us to completely redefine uh, diagnosis, treatment, and therapeutic development. Um, I certainly agree with that. It, I would take it from a different point of view, uh, rather than the system's point of view, which is clearly in terms of day-to-day -day living for people who have mental illness. There's just relatively no access to care or good care. Um, and, you know, that, that's a huge problem. The problem of science, basic science, uh -huh. genotyping, and, and getting accurate phenotypes. But I think that there's also a huge complexity of the nature of the diseases themselves. And that is a huge barrier. I mean, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a barrier. So you have illnesses, the illness that I have, I have in my family, um, I study uh, bipolar illness uh, along with depression are um, often lethal illnesses that occur very young uh, in difficult circumstances with problematic drugs. And so the major clinical problems turn to, tend to be how do you get somebody into treatment? How do you keep them in treatment? Uh, because most people will stop taking their medications. Um, and how do you keep people alive? Because the suicide rate, the death rate is highest with these particular two, il two illnesses. Thank you. Image? I, I would just violently agree with all those comments that have been made. And, and what I'll add to the conversation is, what I would say is, is what was astonishing to us coming into this field, having worked in other therapeutic areas, was the, that phrase, the, the soft bigotry of low expectations. People don't expect our patients to get better, and in, particularly in addiction. The, the, the definition of treatment success is often initiating treatment with an opioid replacement medication. And in schizophrenia, uh, there's an expectation that, that this is a, a chronic progressive disease, where it, we know that early aggressive intervention can change the trajectory of the disease over, over a, a patient's life. So I think that's a huge impediment to getting optimal outcomes. Thank you, Richard, for uh, setting that up. Um, I agree with all of what you have said, and especially what you were just saying, Richard, about the need for early intervention. Uh, and I believe that uh, we have tools. We, I know we have tools today, uh, uh, the type of aggressive early intervention you're talking about, a form of care called coordinated specialty care, is extremely effective for helping people, young people, developing their first psychotic episode to recover to full and meaningful lives uh, with a, a range of team-based treatments apply together to each young person in a coordinated way. Um, it's, and so the problem is that it's not widely accessible. Only about 8% of young people developing psychosis in the United States each year, uh, based on the capacity of the system to treat them, can access the care that they need through the, this type of care. Uh, and the problem behind that is that, in part, um, is one part is that it's new, but another part it's not widely recognized by providers and insurers that it exists and that it is a better solution both in effectiveness and cost effectiveness uh, uh, to the care of people with serious mental illness. So I believe the biggest barrier that, that people with serious mental illness are facing in the system is one of payment. Uh, so one, what, one, what, one mind, what one mind is working on is uh, developing the data to show to insurers 
that it's worth paying for this, this kind of care in the long run and that um, it'll bring better outcomes for patients and save the insurance companies money in the long run. So we started by framing a little bit about um, what the barriers are from different perspectives and we really have a, a, a broad range. Let's go back for a second and talk about then the price of inaction. So what does this cost an individual? What does it cost a family, a community? Um, in personal price, if you would, as well as kind of the cost to the system. And I'm going to throw a couple of things out um, just to get us started. So range of the issue, about one in five Americans lives with a diagnosable mental health issue. Less than 40% of them, I'll say that again, less than 40% of them are receiving treatment for those conditions. As a result, they die 25 years earlier on average. Um, in addition, this is, um, from a resource standpoint, also extremely costly, in that in the U.S., about $200 billion a year, and worldwide, a little less than $3 trillion, with a T, dollars or, per year. So those are just a few kind of cost frames, if you would, but Brandon, can I start down with you this time? And can you get us started on that? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so the, your initial question, could you repeat it please? Yes, so we want to know the cost of not yes. addressing this immediately. And you yes. can take cost, if you would, uh -huh. the full range of the personal cost, the yeah. family, community, as well as the collective cost to, um, you know, to the country and to the world. Thank you. Uh, so the cost of not addressing serious mental illness, especially addressing it early, is catastrophic for our society as well as for the individuals who live in it. Uh, I'll start with the individual level. Um, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia in 1990, and I can only speak for myself, but I have many friends who also live with the illness, and their experiences are somewhat similar. Uh, I thought at the time that there were demons waiting around every corner to drag me to hell for all eternity. It was terrifying. Every moment I had this delusion telling me that I had to watch what I did, otherwise I would end up doomed. And I nearly took my own life due to the anxiety and depression that resulted from that. Uh, this lasted for months. Um, fortunately, I got early treatment and was able to re have ultimately been able to recover uh, due to that loving family support and continued involvement in the community. Uh, but the cost to uh, to families is also large. My parents had to uh, devote lots of resources to tell me to recover. Uh, I know of families who've had to take their young person off of their insurance policy and put them on Medicaid, which is very challenging to do uh, uh, in many cases, so they can access the care they need. Uh, and the cost to society is massive. Um, for you, as you mentioned, uh, $200 billion for serious mental illness in the United States. The cost of schizophrenia alone is $156 billion, most of that cost, uh, due to um, health care costs and lo lost productivity not only for the individuals afflicted, being many of them being debilitated for the rest of their lives if they don't get good treatment early, uh, and the cost of lost productivity for the individuals helping them and their families, because they need to take time off work to help these, these people. Um, so it's a major cost to individuals and, and families and their communities as well as society. Thank you, Brandon. That's a great way to really begin to frame this. Richard? I think the numbers almost speak for themselves. Uh, what struck us as we got deeper into this whole quote unquote treatment system uh, is the porosity, the interplay between the criminal justice system and the, and the, and the health care system. And talk about a waste of money. If you came from another planet and saw how we deal with people with serious mental illness in our community where we end up most of the time involving them in criminal justice, and often behind bars, they have better care than they find out in the community. It's utterly absurd. There are a few things that are more expensive than frequent recidivism, chronic progressive disease, more fully elaborated disease over time. And when people come out of the criminal justice system, they're poorly equipped with all the other, what are called social determinants of health, housing, jobs, and the like. It makes absolutely no sense. And you, from an economic perspective, put aside the, the, the compassion, the human aspect of it, you look at it just as a pure matter of economics, say this is a solvable problem. 
I spend far more time in this town than I ever thought I would when we started a company focusing on the brain because you realize that the science takes you so far, but then it's all about public policy. And we can do everything we want in the labs, and it just dies at the doorstep if we can't figure out a way to get in, in, into pay. And the cost of that is, is staggering. Okay. I, I would get back to this, uh, at a couple of those points, but particularly these are early onset illnesses. This isn't cancer. This isn't heart disease uh, that's hit later. These are illnesses that hit young, so it affects people's entire lives. Um, mainly it kills people, it leads to addictions and drug problems. 60% of people with bipolar illness have a comorbid alcohol or drug abuse problem. Um, the uh, jail rate are very, very high in mood disorders, depression, bad recurrence, depressions. So these are illnesses that kill people, if you're a college student, I spend a lot of time on college campuses because of the age of onset of bipolar illness. Um, it's, suicide is the second killer. Uh, it also has a de devastating effect on attention span, cognition, uh, social relationships, every aspect of life that is meaningful to people. And people don't get good care. They don't get, um, you know, uh, they get a very limited amount of care from society and from universities and so forth. So it's a huge problem, but a lot of it is based in the fact that it's an early onset illness, and it's an illness that is progressive, uh, so that it has a, a definite effect on the brain over time, and you know that's that's a huge aspect of, of these illnesses as well, which hasn't been as well as much talked about, but it's been quite well studied. So, I mean, I think the good news is that um, it's such a mess um, and, and it strikes at the core of who we are um, as a society. So when you look at school shootings or, um, or veteran suicides or, you know, eighth grade suicides or, um, or homelessness, I mean, it's the same issue, right? There, and, and so I think that um, the, the detection and, and measurement and definition and early intervention in this space um, with technology uh, is, is happening at the same moment where I think we're having even a bipartisan uh, uh, societal moment where, where people are acknowledging that it's a mess. And I, I've been on the Hill the last couple of days and, it's, it's interesting, it's the one thing that you can talk about with the Republicans and Democrats right now, and they're, you know, they kind of let down their, you know, their partisan guard, and they're willing to have a conversation about it. So it, it, I think we're in an interesting societal moment where we're recognizing the cost, not just the economic costs, which are staggering, um, but um, even being able to talk about some potential solutions that, that can, um, reduce cost and also, um, as you said, ripple through the, the criminal justice system and all of the other systems, so. Mm -hmm. Did they take all the good ones or did you have one? <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot to say. I, I forgot to mention that I, I run for the World Health Organization, this thing called the World Mental Health Survey Consortium, where we do needs assessment surveys around the world to feed into the Global Burden of Disease initiative and uh, there are a lot of statistics come out of that, uh, one being that um, the median age of onset of mental disorders around the world, of the people who will ever have a mental disorder in their life, is 13. Um, and uh, which compares to the late 40s for hypertension and the mid 50s for arthritis and so forth. And one of the things we've done because of the global burden of the disease and trying to put mental disorders in perspective, we ask all around the world, we've surveyed 300,000 people in 30 countries. Um, we know who has a history of depression and anxiety disorder and panic and psychosis and bipolar disorder. And we also ask about 10 chronic physical illnesses, arthritis, asthma, diabetes, and so forth. And we say to people, we take the 10 most common mental disorders and these 10 physical disorders, and we say to people, um, how much does it get in the way of your life? You know, on a zero to 10 scale, or how many days out of roll? And uh, it's staggering how much higher mental disorders is than physical disorders. Now, one could say, well, that's because people who are depressed are depressed. Of course they're going to say it's terrible. But what we do, because we have this enormous sample, we take people who are depressed and have asthma 
or have panic and diabetes, we say, well, look, so you have these two things. What if I had one magic pill? And it could either make your depression go away or it could make your asthma go away. Which one would you want? 93% of the time, people want the pill for the mental disorders. All around the world. Um, there is nothing as devastating to your life as the deep, deep fundamental pain and suffering that's associated with a mental disorder. So you can put all the statistics on it you want to, but that's sort of the reality of people's lives, which I think we have to kind of grapple with in a way that we're, we're not right now. And one other little statistic uh, is that the typical person who has a mental disorder who gets into treatment says it took 12 years before the onset of the disorder and getting the treatment. And when we ask people, did you ever get help by treatment? About one third of people do. And we say, how many doctors did it take until you got help? The average is five. And of course, most people, because they have mental disorders, they give up way before five. And that's where we have the high suicide rate we have. So people like Brandon uh, or my son who had a similar kind of issue are, are lucky because they are at the right places or have the right parents to get them places. But uh, the, the ability to wend your way through this non-system is the enormous challenge. And uh, figuring out a way to help people do that is, is our challenge. So I think we framed the challenge, um, which is not trivial. So let's switch our attention to solutions. And um, I love the panel because your perspectives are um, so complementary, and I'm looking forward to some solutions coming from uh, different angles. And I also want to invite y'all to, I'm sorry, I got Southern. I would also like to invite you all uh, to feel free to uh, speak to, you know, just speak to each other. You don't have to wait for me to kind of call on you. So um, let's have a discussion. And for you, please start thinking about any questions um, or comments that you want to share with us because we're going to try and save some uh, time for you to join into the conversation. So solutions. Boy, well, there, there are several solutions. One of them is the... Uh, the downstream solution, there's a couple people here on the panel who are working hard to find new medicines. Uh, there's also some upstream things. As we said, uh, mental disorders start early in life. Uh, we have a terrible early intervention uh, track record. There's this great group of people in Australia that Brad is familiar with, Pat McGorry and friends who do these early interventions in school systems. We need to do a lot more than that. Shep Kelb's work at Hopkins, you know, the good behavior game of working with kindergarten and first grade kids. There's an enormous amount we could do. And of course, one wonderful thing about kids is we know exactly where to find them from nine to three, five days a week, mm -hmm. nine months a year. You know, I mean, there, there they are. And uh, uh, this, is, uh, this imposes another burden on the school system, but this is, uh, this, is, this is the kind of intervention, that's what we're doing. We're trying to make people uh, healthy, productive citizens, and this is the way we can do it. So that's one thing. Uh, but on the today basis, uh, there, as I said, there are an enormous number of treatments that are very, very helpful. And, and experts know. So. Kay mentioned uh, you know, uh, high rates of suicide among bipolar disorders. But lithium is a much better medication than any of the newfangled medications for Clozeril makes much more sense than any other antipsychotic. I mean, we know things about this, but we don't act by, on by it. By orders of magnitude. That's right. Yeah, yeah by right. orders of magnitude, exactly right. So figuring out how to get the right treatments to the right people. I spend a lot of time working with the VA in primary care. Uh, with people who come in, 400,000 people a year. The VA is the biggest integrated healthcare system in America. 400,000 people come in a year asking their primary care doctor for treatment of depression or PTSD, often with substance or no, often some combination. And the primary care doctor has to figure out what to do. Is he going to use one of those seven psychotherapies and which one? Is he going to do one of these 15 pills? Which one? Some combination. Should I use the integrated care system? And we're trying to use uh, the kind of thing Bob was talking about, machine learning, artificial intelligence, gathering information to try to rationalize those decisions to get exactly the right thing to the right patient, monitoring patients over time so you can quickly intervene when things don't work. It's not rocket science. Uh, it's a little harder than rocket science, but I mean, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's something you can do. And uh, it, based on what we have come to feel uh, that is, is the realistic thing at the moment, 
the 30% or so of people who do well with existing treatments could probably be pushed to 75% if we just kind of rationally followed our nose. And then that's probably as good as we could do at the moment, and we've got to wait around for these guys for the next 25%. But we could do much, much more, much quicker than we do right now. I think that's the short-term solution. Why do you think we don't? I mean, why aren't we in schools, and why aren't we applying what we do yeah, now? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I, I think it's not because uh, school teachers are evil, uh, but because schools nowadays are asked to be uh, the preschool program, the, the, the post-school program, the minister, they're asked to be everything for everybody, and they're drowning, and they're under-resourced, and they see their primary task as one thing, and these other things as diversions. Mm -hmm. So if we could figure out ways of making the system integrated in a way it's not, uh, we'd go very far. We see this, by the way, in collaborative care for depression, one of the, uh, one of the potentially most useful thing that's been developed is a guy, Wayne Caton, who just died a couple years ago from the University of Washington, who developed this program in primary care where he has na nurse case managers who are mental health specialists working with the primary care doc. Because primary care doctors, when you come in and say, I'm really depressed and my back is killing me and I can't sleep, and they say, well, tell me more about your back. Um, you know, they, they just want to run the other direction. However, if they know there's this case manager, this integrated care person, they say, oh, tell me about the depression. I know something to do. And there have been several experiments showing that when you put that system in place, all of a sudden, doctors start recognizing depression in a way they didn't before. People get treatment. When NIMH's grant ends out in three years, all of a sudden, all the depressed people disappear. They don't see them anymore. So there are ways of putting in place systems that can make people feel that they can manage problems by getting the help they, they don't have right now. And those helps exist in various places. They're just not connected in the way they need to be connected. So. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you. Bob, you look ready. So I, talked, uh, <laughs> I talked about the revolution in data, and it's already here. So on, on, the, you know, on the genomic side, on kind of measuring markers in the blood to be able to actually have data when we didn't have any um, about this space. And, and I think the biggest revolution in the near term, which will happen even in the next year or two, is going to be in <laughs> passive monitoring um, using and creation of longitudinal data um, where we can actually tell almost as, as good as a functional MR today what your mind is doing just based on looking at factors that can be measured by a wearable or by voice or by machine learning on keystrokes. And um, when you have that kind of passive monitoring, you can have interventions that improve outcomes and reduce costs. And we have uh, one effort in the space that I, I won't talk about the specifics of it, but, but that they've done a clinical trial where they're using um, passive monitoring um, with people who have been uh, recently hospitalized. And, and they were able to reduce cost 40%. 40% with a single app, um, just through diversion and early intervention. So I think when, when you think about data and you think about uh, figuring out how to have a national conversation about how do we measure these things in a confidential manner but intervene early, you know, little Adam Lanza, the first time, uh, you know, he, he kept coming home with bruises from Sandhurst Elementary. Um, in, in third and fourth grade, and the first time he made a threat against the school that he wrote down was fifth grade, eight years before he shot up the school. So, so I think this uh, quantitation will be truly revolutionary, and we've seen it on the therapeutic side as well. So one of the problems is so we, we had another company that, that had a failed trial of a, of a drug in depression. We happen to be running a, a parallel secondary endpoint using some of these quantitative tools and in two very phenotypically significant factors that were not measured by the 50-year-old questionnaire, we had p-values 0 0.0001 um, in a failed trial. So you just kind of wonder how many drugs out there that we didn't develop you know, might, might actually be be interesting. So, so I think it will be a revolution on both ends in, in therapies, uh, development of therapies, and also uh, development of early intervention. Perfect. Okay.
Uh, there are all the solutions all of us are looking forward to because what you're also talking about the kind of work is is getting very early and more accurate diagnosis not not just therapeutics but what follows and so one of the big problems in mood disorders is is our children being over treated over medicated for bipolar illness and you'd like to be able to do some decent science uh, and have a good good treatment early on for those people who really need it and not be medicating kids who don't need it. Um, but I would get back to the issue, the clinical issue of how do you get people into treatment and how do you keep them in treatment and how do you keep them from killing themselves? And Ron Kessler brought up lithium, which is, is for many of us who study lithium uh, and suicide, is one of the awful things about uh, practice in this day and age is that lithium's just not prescribed in the same way it used to be prescribed. And it has a very good track record against suicide. Many, many studies from well over 100 studies now. So it's, it's one of those things that you have now available to do. Another thing is how do you reach out to kids? And, and going to schools would be the ideal solution. But as you say, if, if teachers are asked to do one more thing, they're just going to rebel for good cause. Uh, Hopkins has, uh, Dr. Sh uh, Karen Schwartz said, Hopkins has a program that goes out into the medical middle schools and uh, the upper schools and the private schools and public schools across the country and just teaches children, teachers, and parents the symptoms of depression, nothing else, nothing fancy, just what depression looks and feels like and saying, look, it's treatable. Uh, it's really important that you get treated early because it can get much worse. And so I try and teach the school system as well as the individual students. Uh, from my perspective, you know, it's, people always talk about stigma, which is one of those very stigmatizing words. Uh, and if you're involved in advocacy, I personally much prefer discrimination because it has sort of a little bit more of a legal touch to it. But there's no question that the attitudes that people carry, I mean, I come from a military family. My father was an Air Force pilot um, and had the same illness I do. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's within the Air Force and with the military and across society, there are attitudes that don't encourage people to get into treatment because as soon as you get into treatment, you lose your job. So it's, it's, and that's true in medical schools, it's, it's true across mm -hmm. the place. So we have to change those attitudes. That's very much easier said than done. But I think another thing is that once people get into treatment for mood disorders, because mood disorders are so across human behavior, temperament, values, passion, intellect, creativity, um, particularly people with bipolar illness are very reluctant to give up that positive aspect that maybe 50% of people experience with bipolar illness. So you have to address that therapeutically. And we're, we're just we've done a big consensus study of this, of how can you get doctors to engage patients in a more intelligent way once they come in, instead of just saying, you know, these are all the terrible things about your disease, get medicated or you're going to die, uh, is to say, I know there's some positive things. What can we do to work together to keep some of these things and, and have the best outcome. Because if you ha it doesn't do you any good to have great treatments if people won't take them. Uh, and medication adherence mm -hmm. is probably the most clini clinically relevant problem across all of medicine, across all of chronic disease. It's not a particularly sexy thing to study, but it's, in fact, it's hugely important in terms of life and death. Okay. So I think what, we have to What's interesting is, uh, it, as you go towards quantitative phenotyping, you don't you don't have to have the stigma because you're just going to have a number or you're just going to have a quantitative phenotype that matches with a, a, a machine learning based treatment. And that's where it's going to go. So when you're talking about military people or any other people, you might just say that, you know, you're to 79 and we need to get you to an 85. And here's what we're going to do. Um, we don't have to necessarily define because consciousness and, and, and what we define as happiness, or however we, you define the end state, there is a win state, right? Which is that you're happy. And, and, and so um, getting to that point, uh, we, you actually can get there with, without making all of, all of the assumption. And I always think one of the reasons we have such low adherence is because ha we have shitty drugs. Um, uh, and uh, it, it, it's not that, that we shouldn't work with the existing system to make the existing drugs better, but we need to strive for, for uh, much, much better. And I think the next generation that you're kind of seeing with, with some of these uh, neurosteroids and things uh, will, will be a lot more tolerable. So they're actually thinking about depression, for instance, as not a chronic disease, but a disease that you treat, it gets better. 
and the next time um, you, you, you get it, you get the drug again. So it's like treating you know, a rash with cortisone. And, um, and so we may be moving into that uh, kind of different way of thinking about both ends of the spectrum. I, I think that's really exciting and, and promising. I, I would say that any time you've got illnesses that go across wide syndromes of intellect, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all huge variety of cognitive thinking, temperament, and so forth, it gets so much more complicated what people do. It's for the same people, reason that people use drugs. I mean, people make choices about how they feel, and they don't necessarily always feel terrible, right. you know. And so. Brandon's right. jumping in. Yeah, I love what you're saying about the, um, the, the problem with people not wanting to use treatment because it has side effects, that the drugs are, are not as beneficial or as um, tolerable as they could be um, for many people. And, and there are positive aspects to people's experiences with, with brain health challenges. Um, one thing that I really like about this form of care I've been describing, coordinated specialty care, is that it focuses on um, what each person in the program as a patient or client, as they're called, ma what matters to them. So what is it, do you want to, say, these are young people in the program, do you want to get back into school and succeed? Do you want to develop more friend relationships, uh, find a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Uh, do you want to uh, ultimately find a job that's meaningful and successful for you? Uh, and then building on that um, to help those young people reach their goals in their lives, and then framing the treatment around that. And, and, and working with the young person as they develop toward their goals uh, adaptively to help them get to their goals. Uh, and this, this has a better um, adherence rate than, than just giving somebody medication. Uh, so what, what OneWind is doing uh, to expand and improve this kind of care is uh, working with, uh, throughout the state of California to um, network programs that give this kind of care into a learning healthcare network where uh, they share data with each other on how well the, the patients are doing uh, and, and, and why, uh, based on the treatments that they're giving and the, the, the way they give those treatments, uh, in order to get better outcomes ultimately by sharing the strengths of each program with those of the, uh, of the other programs that can improve in those areas. Uh, and so this, is a, um, this, this gives me a lot of hope to know that it can be expanded and improved. And, and, so, and also, Ron, what you were saying about um, uh, the need to identify early what it is that what treatments people need uh, and to get into schools and, and talk about um, uh, early identification of young people at risk. Uh, so we, the average length of time it takes for somebody to get treatment after a psychotic episode is about a year and a half. Imagine if you had psychosis for a year and a half, you didn't know what it was, you were like I described in my case, you know, fearful every moment for your, your soul. I mean, it's very terrifying. Um, and the brain deteriorates throughout this time. As you said, it's progressive illness. So uh, getting people into care early with early screening is something one line is also working on. Uh, and getting, uh, there are actually a variety of screening tools that can be used um, to identify people who are, say, having paranoid thoughts or uh, believing that, uh, say, the, si the billboards on the side of the road are speaking directly to them. Uh, these are early warning signs of oncoming psychosis. So uh, it's fairly simple to give these screening tools to schools, in theory, uh, to identify people at risk so that they can be referred to care and ultimately pursue the goals they, that matter to them and succeed in their lives. That's, that's something we're working on. And Richard, do you want to jump in and then I'll open it up for um, a quick question or two? I guess I'd say a lot of, uh, of this derives from our, our, our training, but you see that the optimistic foundation is based on data. And I'll talk about addiction for a second because it, it's just a, a glaring example of this. There's something like 14,000 treatment centers in the US for the treatment of opioid dependence. Less than half of them use medicine. And 4% uh, of them use all three FDA approved modalities. I mean, it's astonishing. So you, you get diagnosed with a with a, a raging <laughs> opioid dependence. You go to a treatment center where often there are no MDs involved. It can often just be behavioral counseling, which we're big believers in, and that you need that. But why not use medicine as well? And it all changes if people begin to rely on data, if you rely on outcomes. So, so let's look at the 14,000. 
centers and see who's getting good outcomes. Let's define what a good outcome is. Mm -hmm. Let's see who's getting it. And guess what? If someone's getting great outcomes and using no medicines, fantastic. Let's do more of that. But if they're not, let's stop because it's hurting people. And the other, the other point about data I'll make is Tom Insel, who used to run the National Institutes of Mental Health, said that the diagnosis of depression is akin to the diagnosis uh, of chest pain. It's utterly uninformative because there's, it, it, you can have depression and sleep all day. You can have depression and not be able to go to bed. You can eat, you can not eat. I mean, it's, it's an utterly an uninformative diagnosis. So what we'll derive from what Bob's been talking about, about longitudinal, hardcore, real data, is we'll begin a new taxonomy of this disease. And people in 20 years' time will say, well, why would we ever put that person on SSRI when serotonin has nothing to do with what's going on in their brain? And that goes back to this idea of, of the only way we can get a drug approved, and believe me, this is my life right now, for depression is if you go to FDA and you show them positive changes in two randomized clinical trials on the Montgomery Asberg Depression Rating Scale, which was developed in the 70s, and it has often nothing to do or very little to do with the actual pharmacology or the neurocircuitry that we're affecting with the pharmacologic intervention. So we're looking at a shadow on the wall because that's what the regulators need to see in order to believe it's an antidepressant when there's all kinds of other, uh, other sensitive measures to look at its effect which aren't validated by the FDA. And we need, we need to have some pressure um, on the FDA um, um, from the Hill and from patients um, like we did in cancer and like we did in HIV. And that, that changed those divisions that deal with that markedly. Um, and, and that hasn't quite happened in the CNS world, even though the FDA is getting much more, much smarter um, about all of this. But, but it's probably a time to have a, a conversation about how, how to make it faster and, and, and easier to get drugs, uh, new, new medicines approved. But also, you know, when, when you were saying um, the 50-year-old scale is the HAMD scale, you know, I mean, it's just that, that's sort of the, the standard. And uh, we have kind of a two-part uh, uh, phenotype problem in mental disorders. If you look at where the biggest progress has been made, in clinical medicine of getting things done, it's cardiometabolic stuff. And the reason is, every time you go to your doctor, they weigh you and they take your blood pressure. And if you have diabetes, they get your H1C. So there it is, it's all, we never do that for mental disorders. But there is, in other places around the world, a push towards measurement-based care so we can get sort of a monitoring of how people are doing. And once we get that, then we can put that in the big data and start saying what's working, because you have a sense. The second problem is, though, what in the heck is this thing that we're trying to measure? Um, and, and you're right, that the depression is not one thing. Uh, and people who have what we call a mental disorder, if you ask them what the problem is, they have very different senses of it. In the case of bipolar disorder, the big issue for people with bipolar disorder is not mania, it's depression. The depressions are much deeper and much longer for bipolar disorder. People like being hypomanic. The, the goal of living is constant hypomania. I mean, that's, you know, sort of, but, and so you don't see them during the manic phase. They come during the depressive phase. And of course, many of those people incorrectly get diagnosed as having major depression. They get an antidepressant and it flips them into a hypomania and they kill themselves. So well, there's all kinds of things that we're measuring the core of what's this thing we're attacking. You have to start there. And then all the fancy stuff we're all interested in doing can take off. I'm gonna, yep, so, oh, we got a thousand questions. <laughs> Okay, we have one in the back, somebody that's been standing up for a while. So can you step forward and quickly state your name and Thank question? You. Um, no Shami Fine. Yes, and, uh, yes, and we my uh, first, Dr. Jameson, thank you. I read your book in medical school. It changed how I work with patients and how I treat patients. Um, Dr. Kessler, your point about the median age of onset of mental illness globally is 13, yeah. is a statistic I have not heard till this morning, but brings me to my call for action to everybody. We have a problem in that we don't have enough providers. So if you look at, if the, average, if the median age is 13, the number of adolescent psychiatrists just in the US is really small. Um, and there is nowhere to get treatment if you want to. So similar to what I think we've done with the nursing shortage we announced several years ago, can we make a call to move more people into this discipline? Again, everything you all have commented on on the panel 
is very worthy. We need different drugs, but we also need to use the drugs that we have. We need to have different modalities, but we also don't have practitioners right now. Thank you. And this is where machine learning will be huge, right? So you're, you're going to be able to use best practice with, with quantitation to, to be able to have people who are not, uh, you know, 20 years of training actually implement some of these solutions. It's the, the non-sister model. You know, um, uh, oh, if you go to Sloan yeah, Kettering for cancer, and you see an oncologist for 20 minutes, but then you see a social worker for an hour, you get into three groups, there's a family group. I mean, you're, you're inundated with stuff because they have a system. We don't have a system. Uh, and it's easy to push things down to various levels if you get organized. Um, and it's why I like working with the VA because they're, they're, they have a commitment to like the nurses and the nurse case managers and so forth. Putting a system together, it's doable. Uh, but we have to we have to get going on. So can can I just do one more question and then we'll try and stay around. We're moving up towards you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, thank you so much. And it's really really interesting. I'm just noticing a lot of talk on medication, and I'd love to know, um, especially in the U.S., what's needed to promote a more holistic approach to well-being and mental health, which will not only help um, in terms of cost saving. For society, but also personals, personal development and life, mm -hmm. and dealing with their mental struggles. Thank you. Thank you. I'll speak to that. Thank you. So, um, so there is a, a new initiative developing with the, a, par a partnership between the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health and the NIMH, and um, two several potentially several drug companies and two nonprofits, NAMI and, and One Mind. Uh, called the Accelerating Medicines Partnership for Schizophrenia, which this is just preface here, which will likely uh, is its goal will be to develop medications for the early stages of schizophrenia using biomarkers. But what one mind's contribution to this this uh, this um, partnership will likely be, we're still in discussions about it, will be to uh, look at using those same biomarkers to test innovative psychosocial treatments. Uh, things potentially like meeting-making therapies. Uh, you may have heard of open dialogue is, is, that's been tested in uh, uh, Scandinavian countries and been successful there. Uh, things like expressive arts therapies, other psychosocial therapies, including uh, things like cognitive training, um, which is a form of neuroplasticity-based therapy, which addresses the, the exact symptoms of schizophrenia that are the most debilitating, like the inability to think clearly and stay motivated. Um, so that. That, that gives, that, that's some cause for hope. So I, I think I hear the hordes outside uh, trying to get into the, the room and they're knocking the, the walls down um, already. So let me apologize to those that have not had a chance to answer uh, or to ask your questions. And let me thank uh, the panelists who have shared such tremendous thoughts. Thank you for coming, your time, and all the work that you do.